Hi there, this is Erin Cooney. Welcome to the Irish Dance Business Owners Podcast. Today I am joined by Danielle M. Bloom. She is located in the Twin Cities metro area in Minnesota, and she is the creator of the Step Collective. So welcome, Danielle, to the podcast. Thanks, Erin. Thanks for having me. I'm so interested to hear more and to share with the audience what the Step Collective is. If you can just give us a little bit of information about that, and then we're going to be diving into some really cool topics. You just know a lot about the history of Irish dance, so I thought it would be great if we could share some of the some of your education and expertise in the history area of Irish dance as well. But first, let's start with the Step Collective. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So the Step Collective is a project that I've kind of been developing over the last couple of years. And it's a resource and educational space and also meant to be a little bit of an entertainment space as well. We'll see how things develop this year. But it brings dancers and musicians and lovers of dance and music together in one space, whether it's virtual or hopefully more, more here in 2021 and 2022 in real life, to celebrate and get to know more about these traditions that we all share kind of across the North Atlantic. So we're talking about Irish dance traditions in Ireland, whether it's kind of modern Irish step dance or old regional forms of, of Irish step dance or set dancing or Kaylee dancing, and then also forms of dance from Scotland and clogging from England and even going over to like the Baroque France kind of area, which really influenced a lot of dancing around the world. Anywhere that you have square dancing, which could be Haiti, there's Haitian square dancing, there's French Canadian square dancing, there's American square dancing, there's Irish set dancing, which is square dancing. They're all related and they all stem from this kind of Baroque France. French era, which was a time when that dancing was the pop culture of Europe, right? So we, all of these traditions kind of stem from similar spaces, but have their own unique cultures and also currently have very like thriving cultural communities, whether you're in, in Canada, the US, Ireland, wherever. And so the Step Collective really sets out to bring folks from these different communities together. And my home base is Irish dance and music. And so that it's a little, it's a little Irish heavy, but I really, I bring in voices and experts and performers and people who are just really, really engrossed in these other cultures for conversations, for workshops, tutorials. Right now, I haven't updated the Step Collective website since March, so you can still see my St. Patrick's Day presentation, which talks about, which shares some old versions of the Irish set dance St. Patrick's Day and talks about the history of that particular set dance. And it's also a podcast, so I, I bring these folks together for conversations. Um, primarily, at the moment, the newsletter is the thing to get, the thing to that really has the most meat on its bones. And my goal is to, I know we're all so busy and gets inundated with so much information. And I set out every month to create an email that is just really filled with interesting content that people who love step dance or who love fiddle music are going to like be happy to have in their inbox. So the newsletter is kind of a, a thing I've spent my most, the most of my energy on at the moment. Yeah. And I have a feeling that a lot of Irish dance teachers who are listening <laughs> are really going to be interested in this newsletter. So can, can you just share maybe like, are there different segments to the newsletter? Like, are there certain topic specifics or are, like, are you always kind of the expert talking about things or are you referring to other people or events happening or kind of what does the newsletter entail? That's a good question. And since this is a business owner's uh, podcast, I think people might relate to this aspect of it a little bit. I'm still trying to figure out what my voice is. Yeah. Um, first, I was calling it Danielle Emblem's Step Collective because it really, at this moment, it's all coming from me <laughs> and bringing other voices in, but it's coming from me. But also, I don't want it to be all about me. I want it to be about the community. So I've removed my name and I don't feature very much in the newsletter. If you didn't know me, you might have no clue that I'm the person behind it when you get this newsletter in your inbox. So I'm still playing around with that because it really is my baby and it has a lot to do with my interests. I feel challenged with that in terms of just being a professional person in a world of tradition in general, you know, that balance between participating in something that is a tradition and part of community, and then also wanting to kind of make money and having to, to have that kind of presentation as well. It's always a balance. But <laughs> that being said, the way that the newsletter kind of currently stands, um, 
it's really is bringing lots of different expert voices together in one space. And so the first kind of segment of the newsletter, I try to share if there's any step collective created content. So that might be new interviews that are on the podcast or panel conversations. I've been doing roundtable discussions with that have been so much fun. And I've been curating dance programs for some festivals for the Flurry Festival in upstate New York and for the Old Songs Festival in New York. And so that the Step Collective curated content is kind of the first thing in the newsletter. And then we go into kind of like educational, historical resources, performances. If there are artists that are kind of masters in any of these traditions that are doing something really interesting, or if there's a new thing out there that I think people might want to know about, then I, then that's the next section. So there's a lot of videos and resources and equity and being a voice that represents all people, all human beings is really important. So I, I really, I, sometimes we get a little radical in that section and uh, yeah, <laughs> I won't dig into that anymore. And then the last section is really like what's happening, what's on. So I haven't sent out my July newsletter yet. We might, it might turn into an August newsletter, but if you, it, I have a roster of about 30 artists so far. And as I feature artists, they kind of join that roster. And so if you are really into old style Irish step dance, or if you're really into French Canadian dancing, or if you're really into old American old time fiddling, whatever artists I have on the roster, you get to see what they're doing and where you can find them, whether it's virtually or in the real world. Wonderful. And I, I just think that a lot of people are going to be interested in this information, whether it's, you know, in your head of what you're going to say every month or not. I just think a lot of Irish dance teachers want this. And I think it's hard to sometimes find the historical information that we want. It's almost like, I know almost everything I know of the history of Irish dance, I've learned from like one of my Irish dance teachers. So I think that any teacher that's listening to this, if they're interested in this kind of information, it's amazing because then when their dancers are asking them questions <laughs> or they can just share because I think it's so important for the dancers to have an appreciation for Irish dance and you know, kind of the history of it and respect the cultural aspect of it and, and see how it's intertwined with all these other how it's come about and how it's evolving and then, you know, the history and respite. So, so I'm excited because I know I don't really know much about the, the history or the <laughs> behind the scenes of the Irish set dances. And you were saying like that you could speak about that a little bit, like Blackbird and St. Patrick's Day and all of that. Would you be able yes. to talk about that a little bit? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and to, I think you bring up such a, I think you bring up an interesting point, like who cares about this information and why, like, why do, why do we want to know? And like, for me, like I'm a historian at heart. I just love knowing the stories behind everything, but as a traditional artist, so I play Irish fiddle as well. And there's a lot of conversations in the Irish music world, especially because Irish music has existed differently than Irish dance in the world. It's kind of stayed more social, even though you have cultists, which is kind of a governing body that holds competitions. For whatever reason, for various reasons, Irish music has stayed more of a social thing, whereas Irish dancing has really gone down um, largely this, this path of competitive, being competitive under various governing bodies. But Irish music, we talk a lot about, like, why is it important to study the masters? Why is it important to look back to the old crotchety recordings of the fiddler playing in the kitchen from 1922 that don't sound all that nice to listen to? Why? And I think at the end of the day, when we're participating in these things that can be shared across the world, and I think Irish dancer, Irish step dancers can relate to this too, you could go anywhere in the world and you could jump on stage with somebody that has that same practice and you can dance a reel, you know, and with a musician, you can say, hey, if you've got a musician that's steeped in the tradition, and if you've got a dancer that knows what they're doing, you can say, hey, play me a reel two times through one A part at the beginning, or an extra A part at the beginning, and you can just do it, like no rehearsal required, right? And it's such an incredible thing, but it requires deep knowledge in order to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so at what point does like changing things too much remove that kind of connectivity between all of us? And also we're participating in living traditions that are constantly shifting and evolving. And when I was competing, 
God, 20 years ago. I don't even, I, man, 20 years ago, like the competitive world was completely different. Dancers now are, are moving differently and doing completely different moves than I was doing in competition. And that is also, and same thing with music. There are a lot of innovative things happening in Irish music and it's all valid, but what's the balance? And I think yeah. we have to always have an eye to the past in order to hold those connections while we're continuing to move forward and evolve. Um, yeah, which does- I love that connection piece. I mean, I was just realizing that for myself as you were describing that. Like, I always thought of it as kind of like a, a similar language. Like you instantly kind of connect with someone if you know that Irish dance and you're able to successfully communicate with them. And even Irish musicians- when you know a deeper knowledge of Irish dance, <laughs> then you're able to communicate better and um, connect better. I don't even know how to explain it, but I just feel like it's like a, it's like the same language. And I always thought that was so cool because like you said, it's worldwide. Like you could meet someone and not even speak the same language and, and dance a reel with them or dance to them playing the fiddle tune, you know, Irish dance to someone playing the reel or whatever. And just kind of having that knowledge to be able to do that is just so fun. Is what's the social piece of it. I love that. Exactly. And that can, we can transition into the, the set dances. And there's so many directions we can go in. And I know this is, we have only a short amount of time, but I think that the traditional set dances are a really interesting kind of little example of how the Irish dance tradition has shifted over time and kind of where it came from. And, um, so these traditional sets, the Garden of Daisies, St. Patrick's Day, the Blackbird, all of those, I think most Irish dancers know at least a couple of them. And mm -hmm. the thing with the set dances is that they are very unique to Irish step dancing. You've got a tune that goes with the dance. And if you're doing the traditional version of the dance, we're probably, a lot of us are doing a really similar version, right? We could all get up and dance St. Patrick's Day together. And it's kind of like in tap dance, the shim sham is the tap dance kind of national anthem. And anytime you have a big tap gathering, everybody gets up and dances the shim sham. And they might all have their own styles and their own variations. And I think our Irish set dances are kind of similar to that. But the set dances were not as fixed as they are now pre-1900s. So these set dances were created by these old itinerant dancing masters. And the itinerant dancing masters of Ireland were participating in what was the pop culture of Europe during the Baroque era. And it was stemming kind of from the French and English kind of royal courts, essentially, these dancing master traditions. Um, and that's a whole other story. But in Ireland, Ireland was really, I always like to talk about how multicultural Ireland always has been. You have Vikings, you have Normans, you have over the years, you have so many cultures coming in and integrating into Irish culture and bringing their traditions and practices. So there's a lot of influence in Irish culture from these other areas. And also the Irish were go, they might be on a small island, but they were traveling and they were going back and forth and bringing things back as well. So we have a lot of just multiculturalism. So this dancing master tradition was a popular thing in Ireland and Irish people started taking them on. And we've got some really interesting old accounts of really old Irish dancing masters. And there's one Mr. Tench from, I think, Wexford. He was in the early 1800s, I believe. And he would travel around. And this is what these dancing masters did. They travel around kind of a region and they would stay in one place for a period of time and teach everybody, teach all the kids in that part of, of in that part of the region and people would put them up and feed them and they'd clear out a barn and that would be where they'd you know do the classes every every day and the dancing master would would teach them how to bow and curtsy and how to you know act like ladies and gentlemen because this was again the pop culture of the era and everybody was kind of going along with that uh, concept and and they would teach them the position the five positions the ballet positions because this is the early baroque dancing and so our first position and fifth position and turn out and crossover that we get an irish dance comes from that and then they would do the side steps and then you see in this particular dancing master tench his class gradually gets a little bit more, you see like, okay, now he's doing Irish things. And I think the dancing kind of turned more, became more of an Irish thing once it was kind of mixed with the music. And the dancing masters started doing kind of rhythms and moves. And it just was this whole organic progression. And you had dancing masters all over Ireland who were kind of doing this. And so you had regional styles developing. 
and they would travel with a musician oftentimes, a fiddler or a piper. This particular dancing master, Ten, she's got some dance moves that he calls cover the buckle or upset and curl, and who knows what those actually look like, and we might still do them to this day, who knows. But they also made up their own steps, so you would get the steps from that dancing master, if that's who you'd learn from. And then another dancing master might come through and you get the steps from that dancing master. So you really have these like kind of regional styles. In the north of Ireland, the regional style was very big and balletic at a certain point, whereas in the south and southwest, it was much closer to the floor and didn't move very much. And in the 1950s in New York, those two styles kind of merged and that's kind of the competitive style that we have today, especially in like CLRG dancing, but everywhere because of globalism, um, you, that's kind of where what we have today in Irish dance comes from. So, you know, the baby steps or the more traditional steps might be a little closer to the floor and um, not move quite as much. And then as you get more progress in your dancing, you're doing the big leaps and you're moving across the stage. And that's more of the Northern Irish influence, which stems from New York City, 1950s. And uh, Jean Butler from Riverdance is um, part of that lineage. These, these oh. dance teachers that ended up in New York City doing that. And her teacher, Donnie Golden, is part of that lineage. The McNiffs, they're the, the McNiffs brothers came to New York and brought their Belfast style dancing, Northern style dancing. So I'll try to wrap this up. <laughs> we haven't gotten to the set dances. Let's see how much of a nutshell we can do. Basically, these dancing masters each had their own versions of these set dances. And this is a super simplified version, except the set dances weren't fixed. They had multiple sets. You might have three or four different sets that you might dance to the B part of the tune. And the there was a portion of the set that was meant to be any dance. any So like if you're dancing the Garden of Daisies, which is a hornpipe, there's a portion of the dance at the end where you just pick a hornpipe step. So you could be dancing the same version of the Garden of Daisies with your friends, and then at the end, everybody does their own hornpipe stuff. What happened in the 1900s is Gaelic League officials um, who were working on standardizing Irish dancing, they actually went down to these Cork and Kerry dancing masters and collected versions of the set dances and wrote them down. And so I actually have my little list here. Um, what we know is the Garden of Daisies was written by Freddie Murray, uh, who was a cork dance teacher or a cork dance master. His step, the hornpipe step that was kind of written in, in the uh, annals of time, I don't know if that's even a phrase that makes sense, but I'm trying to sound smart here, is known as Murray's number two hornpipe step, and it's also found in the job of journey work. So that's, those are just hornpipe steps. And you could just dance that to a hornpipe, right? And St. Patrick's Day, the step is called the Lion's Claw. It's a step by a cork dancing master, Din Moore. This is the treble one, treble two, treble three, or batter down, batter down, batter down, da da da. And the set is a Stevie Comerford set, another cork dancing master with Christy Murphy's jig, right? Because St. Patrick's Day is a jig. Christy Murphy is another cork dancing master. So a lot of our sets come from these cork dancing masters, um, and they're still out there. And that's something that I've done a lot of is collecting these old set dances and having multiple versions, which is really fun to do, to do different versions to the same tune. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, competitively, there's only a portion generally that you compete. And then it's kind of like, there's all these other steps too that a lot of dancers don't learn like the length of the dance too. Mm -hmm. So I find that interesting. And between the different organizations, there's a different list of traditional set dances, which is always interesting to your to your brain to kind of like <laughs> be like okay why is it in that organization that this it just builds a lot of curiosity which I think is good because then if we find a historian like you we can ask the question and be like so why and but, I think, yeah I think that would be such an interesting study would be to look at all the organizations look at their set dances and actually just kind of map where they all came from, because actually, if, you, if you're if you just in one organization, you really do get one glimpse probably into these particular dancing masters and these moments in time. But if you pull them all together, you might actually get a, a really interesting, com more complete picture of these old steps that existed pre-1900s. I love that. And kind of going back to, you know, we were talking about just the, the connection and the communication. I love that about Irish dance is that there are these traditional sets. And I do actually personally love that they are standardized, not to lose the other versions of them, though. I know it could be difficult, but because, again, it is just fun to like run into an Irish dancer and like dancing Patrick's Day together because you both right, know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. 
Mm -hmm. All right. So, which is getting to the point almost like all the Irish dancers know some of the river dance choreography now. It's almost like that's another level of like something that's more contemporary, but everyone kind of knows some of that choreography too. And then with all the Irish dance camps happening, more and more people are learning like that kind of choreography to be able to dance it together too. Totally. And I think that that's kind of like, if we think about like current pop culture, like older generations have a tendency to poo-poo what the younger generations are doing because it's new and it's not how it's always been done or whatever. But current pop culture, the Baroque dancing was the pop culture of the era. B era. Bach was writing music for dancing. Bach's music, classical music from the Baroque era is dance music. And it was new mm. and it was exciting and everybody... And now these things are old and they are just ingrained in what we know. And same thing with these old Irish dancing masters. It's all the, the sinking step and the rising step. Those we could, we might imagine those have been done forever, but no, they were, they were, cre you know, created out of this era and they were new and river dance is the same. It's, you know, the current new exciting thing. And that's, I think that's such a cool point. Like it is being absorbed into just, it's, it's a thing that everybody, the new exciting thing that's really good that people want to participate in. And now it's just a part of the tradition in some ways. Yeah. So did you want to touch a little bit on the origin of competition? <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to? I mean, I don't know. I like, you know, is this another podcast episode? <laughs> I mean, it, it might be. We can, um, oh man. Yeah. I mean, this is a month long series. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we can dive in, into it in another time if you'd like to. I didn't know if you wanted to touch on it a little bit now or if it would be better to uh, save that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it might be interesting to you. I think there are, to me, there are kind of like three interesting directions we could go in. And one is like the origins and kind of like this whole European dancing master tradition, which we already talked about a little bit. And the other one is this kind of Gaelic revival era. So I have a master's in dance history. And so my thesis is actually kind of organized into these three categories. I'm just realizing as I'm telling you this. And this Gaelic revival era, which is really the origins of competition. And then the diaspora. So like I, how Irish culture and dance has influenced other cultures or uh, participated in other cultures. And like, that's something that is near and dear to my heart at the moment. My mom's side of the family is Métis, which is the mixed blood people of Canada who have step dancing and fiddling traditions and also Quebecois, French Canadian, and they have step dancing and fiddling traditions. So I think if we were to do like two more episodes, I'm not I'm inviting <laughs> myself back, I don't mind. <laughs> but I mean, if, if, we might touch, talk about like what's here in the States, what is our culture or in North America? And then also this kind of Gaelic revival era, which is the origin of competition, which if you want to finish with a little nutshell of that, maybe that, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm just, I think you touched on this earlier, how the, the music scene, Irish music scene is still very much social orientated. And yet the Irish dance scene is very competitive orientated. Mm -hmm. And I've just, keep seeing that like increase and increase and increase like the competitive piece for Irish dance and yeah it just it's just like something it's, it's something interesting to see and kind yeah. of question and so I just thought if there is more to it I mean we may know like the history why it happened but then just to kind of question so why is it still happening you know yeah. <laughs> In that. but yeah you know, and I think it's really important. I think, I think um, competitive Irish step dance is an example of something that has kind of become condensed and it's become kind of, it's an extreme, it's an extreme offshoot. And that's not like in a negative sense, that's not to put it down, but it isn't, it's extreme. <laughs> it's athletic. It's, you've got, there's a lot of kind of rules and things that you do in it. And it's an incredible, beautiful kind of representation or, or extension of Irish culture and tradition. And it's also like its own world in a lot of ways, right? And it continues to get, it continues to progress. And I think because it's, it's kind of in its own world, it progresses in ways that isn't always necessarily related to the other music and dance aspects. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's important. Like I, I personally, again, this is my own value system, but I think every Irish dancer, because I think Irish dancers feel like they're connecting to Irishness and culture, you know, a lot of us. And I think it's really important to, whenever you're really digging into something with blinders on, I think it's always important just to continue to like 
know about the bigger picture, right? The more we know, the more we relate and, and the more what we do can be fuller and more whole. And that doesn't mean we're going to stop, you know, pointing our toes and crossing our feet and doing all that kind of stuff and just become Shannos dancers, old style dancers, but just knowing it's out there and being able to value all of that as well is important. So I do think digging into that history is, has value, even if it's not something that you're going to like dig into as much as you are doing with the competitive stuff. So and, I don't, yeah, I don't. And something just as small as like, for me, knowing that like the, I don't know, in, in CRN anyway, there's a difference between a fela and a fesh and like these different terms, but like, I believe, right. Like, like when fesh began, it was like, you know, there might be competitive dancing, but there's also competitive music and baking and yeah, like stuff, right? So it's like, yeah. that is very social. It's not just the people dancing. It's like all these other things too, almost like a fair. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, and it was, it was in the early 1900s, late 1800s, it was a real, it was a really important moment in Irish history. The Irish were kind of getting um, ready to rise up and fight for their independence. And through the 1800s, all of the famous, you know, poets of the 19th century in Ireland, they were really starting to write a lot about this kind of nostalgic sense of Irishness. And it's almost like you have this kind of like rumbling of like, hey, like we've been colonized people for so long, but we have an identity. We are, our identity isn't a colonized people. We have culture, we have language, and we're at risk of losing it. And so this is what was happening at the end of the 1800s. And an organiz a couple of organizations formed. The GAA, which is the Gaelic, Gla Gaelic Athletics Association formed. And that formed in the, let me see in my notes, I'm not always the best with dates, so I keep them, keep notes close. The GAA was formed in 1884. And then in 1896, the Gaelic League was formed. And so you have sports and language primarily, and you've got all these ancient Irish sports, legitimate ancient Irish sports. And I was just talking to somebody yesterday who plays handball, and he was filling me in on the origins of handball. Not, I don't think ancient, but very Irish. Um, and so these things became really important in building Irish identity. And the GAA was very affiliated with the kind of paramilitary movements that were happening to the Irish Republican Brotherhood and the IRA, Irish Republican Army. And the Gaelic League was less affiliated, but it was a lot of the same people who were like coming together largely in Dublin and saying, let's, let's, we got to do something here. We got to, we can't lose what we've got. We can't lose who we are. So the Gaelic League formed with the real intention of preserving Irish language. But they, they decided to start having these gatherings, with they, which they called a fesh, and the, they held competitions. It was a healthy competition to bring people together and say, hey, like, hone your skills, get good at what, like, practice, really start to develop it, and let's all come together and kind of celebrate this thing. So the early fesh Shana had a, a lot of language-related competitions, recitation, essay writing, poetry, and there was, like, a dance competition. And I think it was like jig and reel. And then over time, the dancing and the music kind of became more popular. And you see in the kind of old Gaelic League publications, you see the different, over the years, you see, okay, now we've added a hornpipe. And now we have men's reel and women's reel. And now we have different age groups. And so it really turned into this whole big thing that took off. And a separate kind of committee on Irish dancing was formed, which is the origins of CLRG. And also the origins of a lot of the other dance organizations too, because CLRG formed and then a lot of dance teachers, especially in Cork, who had their own dance teachers association that was formed in 1895, which is a really unique moment in history. They were like, hang on, this isn't representing everything. We don't agree with all the kind of black and white boxes we've got here. We're going to do our own thing. And so on Kogal is one, one organization that kind of stemmed from that kind of rebellion against the one organization and and kind of from there a lot of organizations formed based on different value systems and so we tend to get these this kind of tunnel vision within our organizations but there's this huge shared history and the first Kaylee was held in 1897 that's a whole other and that's related to the North Kerry or the Kerry dancing masters which is related to the early freshes and there's this huge old history that we all share yeah no I I love learning that because I really didn't know that 
the first fesh kind of experiences were really based around language. I didn't know that. So that's really interesting to know. All right. So what can you tell everyone about how to find your, the Step Collective, how to access the newsletter, the podcast, how to support the Step Collective, all of that. (laughs) So you're all Irish dance people, I'm sure, listening here. And I can't promise it'll be all Irish dance, but there'll be lots of Irish. I I dig into these old dancing masters a lot at the Step Collective. And you might learn a little bit about some of the French Canadian and the clogging and all of that stuff too. But the Step, step, either the stepcollective.com or stepcollective.com gets you to the same place. And that's kind of the website home. You can join the newsletter there. And again, like I said, the newsletter is how you're going to really hear about what going on. I have an Instagram. If you search for the step collective on Instagram and I share little videos here and there, but my, the podcast is called Tradical, T-R-A-D-I-C-A-L. Cause I think tradition is radical. <laughs> like I not, not, I mean, it's cool, rad, but it's also like, yeah. it's radical, right. We're always changing and, and doing new things and rooted in very old ways. So Tradical Podcast, you can find that, The Tradical Podcast, it's on iTunes. So far, I have an intro episode up, and I've got like 25 amazing interviews that I'm hoping to want to get out there, if I could just stop talking <laughs> and, and get it. Um, but if you go to thestepcollective.com, you'll find that there. And then also, the the work I do is kind of just, a, it's a it's a project, what's, what's it called? Passion Project. And I get paid to, you know, curate things for others and get income at some points in time. But right now I'm really trying to just build this Patreon. So patreon.com slash step collective. And what that does is it pays artists for their contributions. So if they do tutorials or interviews or workshops, that Patreon fund actually supports my artists. And then it also eventually someday, I hope supports the work that I'm doing too. So I hope to get more people over there. And as of now, you just decide how much you have to give, but because I believe that tradition should be for everybody and I don't want it to be, I don't want there to be financial barriers. So there aren't necessarily any perks in the Patreon fund yet, but I will have, I will have a couple of things that if you're on the Patreon, I think, I think Patreon is a nice space to be able to have kind of access and you get emails from, you know, creators that you follow with the content. So if you're, and, you know, if you're not wanting to keep up with the website or the social media, I do plan on hope, on having the Patreon be a space where you'll get specific content as well if you're a contributor. Wonderful. Yeah, this is great. And I'm sure there are lots of Irish dance teachers specifically who are going to want this information. They're going to want your podcast. They're going to want the newsletter for sure. And I'm sure that they would be more than happy to donate to what you are doing because it's it's just bringing, you have so much knowledge to share. So thank you so much for coming on today. Even though we just touched a little bit of of what you know. (laughs) I know. Well, and yeah, and I just am so, thank you for having me because I, I feel like I come from the competitive step dance world and also it's so insular that, and you're so, people are so focused on what they're doing. And I've always really wanted to, my, my new life in all of this history stuff and bigger not bigger, but broader kind of aspects in dance. I just, I feel so excited about it and I want to share it with the step dancing world. And it's, it's hard to connect. We're all so busy. So thanks for having me. I'm happy to, really happy to be able to kind of connect with, with that world here through you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Erin. <laughs>